gentlemen, we are live on what is episode one of season two of Luma's work from home webinar series. We got through season one and great news folks. We got the word. We got renewed for a season two. We had to come up with seven new episodes and boy, did we come up with seven great episodes for season two. I'm uh, looking forward to sharing uh, some of that with you. So um, as we uh, work to uh, build our audience here, just a few, uh, just a few remarks. Um, so we're going to talk podcasting today, and you know, I I just really think that there probably couldn't be a more a trend in digital you know media that is more in the zeitgeist uh, than 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 podcasting. I personally find it both a fascinating topic to talk about from a you know b2b and b2c context the business of podcasting um but also from a personal basis i know my own experience uh around podcasting long form media you know consumption via the uh the ears right listening and it's uh i know from my own consumption patterns that this is a media that i just have totally become drawn to and as we'll talk about uh, i'm not alone right in america and across the world in sort of adapting to this new media format i mean and with the addition of sort of the apple uh, airpods you literally this is a media that you can get inside uh, someone's head so uh, i'm super excited for that um and we've got uh, spotify uh my good friend uh, sheila spence uh, joining us today uh, and that should be a fascinating conversation. You know, just last week, my friend Rich uh, Greenfield of uh, of Lightshed uh, Partners had a had a great uh, discussion uh, in their webinar. You should check it out with Daniel Eck, uh, the founder and CEO of Spotify. And you know, I like to think that that's you know, there we go. There's the vision. Uh, there's the overall sort of oversight of the firm. And you've heard of you know delving when you want to get down into the weeds and hands-on keyboard, or as we like to say in corporate development, hands-on checkbook. Uh, today's discussion uh, is going to be with uh, Sheila Spence, who uh, heads corporate development. So uh, why don't we launch into it, uh, Connor? We've got a good. We're once we we breach the hundred person number we're going to go to the slides so welcome to the future of podcasting uh webinar uh, i am delighted today to be joined by not one but two special guests i have my colleague uh longtime colleague connor mckenna who's a vice president uh, at loma partners for those of you who have worked with us you know that's where the rubber hits the road where all work gets done uh, so uh, Connor has been uh, an, is an awesome banker, is also a great thought leader around trends, and he has particularly taken the lead around the trends in audio. Also joining, um, and again, from that sort of hands-on, not keyboard, but checkbook, uh, from the operating side, Sheila Spence, who runs corporate development at Spotify. Sheila and I go back, it's kind of embarrassing, Sheila, over 25 years uh, I know you were in you were in grade school when I met you, um, and uh, you know with a career starting at Solomon Brothers, uh, we were both junior uh, bankers at the firm in the uh, early '90s. Sheila uh, went on; she learned enough about investment banking to get out of Dodge early, so you know a little ahead of me, and uh, and then spent a decade at each of Prime Media uh, and WPP. Uh, and then three years ago, uh, it's almost just after the anniversary right now, joined, uh, joined Spotify and, and really has been the architect of their uh, strategy uh, and sort of development efforts in and around uh, the, uh, the podcasting space. So lots of deals. Sheila is an incredibly uh, thoughtful uh, leader in the digital uh, media sector. And uh, I'm really looking forward to, uh, to this conversation. As you know, this is part of uh, Luma's work from home webinar series uh, that happens every Wednesday at 2 p.m. So we kind of think of it as appointment TV. If uh, you tune in on Wednesdays at 2 o'clock Eastern, you're going to get some uh, topic of relevance if you're in the digital media and marketing sector. 
Now, uh, we, as I mentioned, we got through sort of series one, uh, uh, um, season one, I should say, of the Work From Home webinar series, where we covered off a variety of topics relevant and germane to the digital media ecosystem. You can see there's our sort of seven topics. All of these are available VOD on our uh, website. Um, so go uh, check those out. Uh, and you can consume those at your leisure. And, and again, season two, here we go. The lineup for season two is uh, uh, equally, if not more uh, impressive. If we can flip slides there, Connor, to the next season, uh, so we can talk about some of the topics that we're gonna be covering off. And notice, you know, we got these going out through the middle of June or sort of through to when we would otherwise be packing up and heading to the south of France for Can Lions, and we're kind of hoping that we're going to be done with this work from home thing by then. We'll see. Uh, and of course, kicking off season two is the future of podcasting. Next week, we've got uh, what we're doing is the uh, um, the art of the exit. I'm joined by my colleague, Mark Greenbaum. Mark, if you don't know him, uh, lead strategy and execution at Luma. So he's the uh, one who's uh, relevant to all the deal making and the strategizing in terms of uh, engaged transactions. That'll be a fascinating conversation around our approach to sort of strategic corporate development, which I think you'll find uh, has a lot of twists and differences from the way maybe you think of M&A uh, being executed normally. So that's the promo for next week. Let's get back to it. I'm, again, super excited for the future uh, of podcasting. And at this point, I'm going to step back into the back seat and uh, let Connor drive with Sheila in the front seat. Connor, take it away. Great. Thank you so much, Terry. Um, thrilled to, to be here today talking about podcasting. I think you, you said it well um, you know, it's a very exciting, growing, dynamic space. And, and really, even on just a personal front, I know my own consumption over the last few years has skyrocketed around podcasts. Uh, and really, it feels like it's all around you. Everyone you're talking to is either recommending a new podcast or they're actually starting their own podcast. Uh, so it's really, you know, somewhat feels like we're in this golden age of podcasting uh, and, and the media has, has taken this up over the last year or so as content uh, consumption and monetization is all growing and bigger corporates are really starting to focus in more on this. And, you know, I don't think we could have a better guest today than, than Sheila to talk about what they're seeing at Spotify. You know, arguably Spotify has done the most around, uh, you know, sort of podcasting and moving into this broader audio space uh, over the last year or so. So it was just last February, that the CEO announced this move to become audio first, which is a pretty monumental move from, you know, being pretty much focused on music to really broadly audio. So Sheila, I guess to start off, can you just talk a little bit about this move? What, what led up to this and how are you guys thinking about audio first? Sure, Connor, and thanks for having me today. Um, I, I love this slide because um, this, this is a, was a very, very memorable day, February 6th. 2019. Um, not only did we announce two acquisitions that day, but more importantly, we announced a very, very bold uh, ambition to become the world's largest audio, audio network. And Daniel famously coined the phrase, you know, are our eyes worth 10 times our ears by referencing the level of spend in the video industry versus the audio industry? And we've really been making huge progress um, on tackling that problem over the last 12, 15 months. I mean, not only um, in terms of content, but also technology and really, really building um, a growing and sustainable audience against podcasts. Yeah, and you've definitely been very busy. You mentioned, um, you know, doing two podcasts announced with that announcement. Uh, you also have done two since then. Uh, based on the numbers I've seen, it looks like you now have over a million podcasts on the Spotify network, which is 4X from what was announced last year. And at least according to Chartable, based on um, number of unique uh, users, you're at about 20% market share for podcasts. Uh, so really taking a lot of ground from, uh, you know, from Apple. So can you just talk a little bit about uh, what this last year has been like for you 
uh, you know, it seems like you've been there three years and now in the last year, a lot of acceleration around M&A. Well, it's, you have a number of our acquisitions listed on this slide, and I think we'll probably talk about them a little more individually um, during the next uh, 60 minutes. But I think acquisition um, has been an important, uh, a very important part of the story. Um, we charted the course for audio first based on what we saw happening on our own platform at scale globally, that users who engaged in podcasts were more engaged in music and more engaged in their listening habits um, and just spent more time on Spotify. And that's a, that was an important learning that we wanted to lean into. Acquisitions have been a way for us to uh, not only accelerate, but also bring on pretty uh, critical capabilities, both in terms of teams and technology. Um, and as a result, you've seen the, what, what it shows on the right side of the page that we've actually dramatically increased our share of podcast listening, um, not only in the United States, but uh, uh, globally, where um, we're actually the leading podcast distribution platform in many, many countries. Great. So, um, you know, for today's discussion, uh, I, you know, I think I'd frame it that way. This is definitely a discussion. Um, we are, we have some slides. We're going to go through four sort of categories of, or topics, which is the consumer, the content creation around podcasts, the monetization, and then the ecosystem. We will be using slides as a backdrop to this um, and, and to have some reference for the listeners, but uh, we'll certainly be running this more as, a, as an open discussion. So the first is the consumer. And, and at Luma, we often talk uh, when we're having conversations with both strategists and marketers about this notion of following the consumer. Uh, and that is that we often see in technology that the consumer is ahead of the business ecosystem. So take streaming as an example, or, or OTT, convergent TV, um, where for the most part, consumers are fully converged. They just want to watch what they want, where they want, when they want, and they can do so on any device. They don't really think about the different dynamics of OTT versus linear versus addressable, et cetera. And now the, the business side is sort of catching up to that convergence. Uh, we're actually seeing pretty similar things uh, in the podcasting uh, ecosystem where it seems as though consumers are at least historically leading the way here. So just to give a little bit of context, I thought we'd, we'd uh, you know, talk about how we got here. Uh, so podcasting is by no means a new medium. In fact, the, the, the term was coined over 15 years ago in 2004. Uh, it sort of putted around for a while then uh, while Steve Jobs announced that it was a, a, a huge opportunity in 2005. Uh, it didn't actually happen until 2012 that Apple launched its own uh, podcast app. And at that time, you know, about 46% of the U.S. population was aware of these things called podcasts, but the listenership was uh, far lower. It wasn't until 2014, so 10 years after being coined, uh, that serial was launched and that had a, a dramatic impact. A lot of people credit it with really bringing podcasts mainstream, uh, also sort of changing the dynamic of, of what the genres were under podcasts. Uh, and so quickly from then on, you've seen this huge acceleration of activity, whether it's users growing from you know 50 million US listeners to over 155 million this year. You see the launch of the Spotify app, you see the launch of AirPods, which Terry mentioned, you know, funnel. Uh, podcasts and, and other audio directly into your ear and, and are very easy to take on the go. We've also seen an explosion of, of content. Uh, there were about 500,000 as of 2018. We've now doubled that. Um, you know, and we at Luma even created our audio Lumascape, realizing there was so much going on here that we needed to, to map out this ecosystem. And, you know, you can see this trend uh, and growth uh, in the, the numbers as well for consumers. So, uh, this is a chart from Edison Research and Triton and their infinite dial that talks about the awareness of podcasts. And we really saw that it was pretty stagnant uh, up until about 2015, 2016. Uh, as more and more consumers got to know this, the AirPods were launched, uh, it became easier to access and easier to create. And we've seen this really skyrocket now to where 75% of U.S. consumers are at least aware of podcasts. Probably more importantly is, you know, who's actually listening. And at this point, we're at over 100 million monthly podcast listeners. So very scaled medium. Uh, Sheila, I guess it would be great to just hear, you know, this is sort of talking about the uh, 
podcast industry more broadly and, and growth in consumers. But what are you guys seeing on your end? Well, um, likewise, uh, uh, to these numbers, we've seen incredible growth on our own platform. Um, even if I just think about just the last quarter, already go- growing off of the amazing growth we've seen in the industry, Spotify's user base, we had 19% of uh, Spotify's global MAUs were listening to podcasts. That's up like five percentage points from the last quarter. So still significant growth. Um, And not only is that growth in the number of users, but also growth in consumption. Consumption is growing at triple digit rates. So I see this as being the product of two things. One is an explosion of content. Um, uh, More and more podcasts um, are being uh, created and distributed, but also I think, and I think Spotify has been a primary driver of this, Um, ease and facility of discovery. Um, Everything that we've been doing to bring podcasts and to take people into podcasts has really changed also the consumption curve. Got it. Makes sense. And, and on the sort of who are the podcast consumers, there's there's certainly a lot of areas you can dive into, but two uh, interesting ones, especially as it'll relate to monetization that we'll, we'll talk about later um, is that podcast consumers tend to skew both young and affluent. So uh, if you look at these charts here, the U.S. population uh, from 12 to 34 is about 37% of the U.S. population. It's about 48% of, of podcast listeners are in that younger demographic. Uh, similarly, about 29% of the U.S. makes over 75000 a year, while over uh, 41% of or over 40% of podcast listeners make uh, over that amount. Um, Sheila, I... I read or at least sort of heard anecdotally that uh, Spotify uh, has been a big driver of this, uh, this sort of younger side of listeners in, in podcasting. I think the, at this point, not only do they make up 58, 48% of podcast listeners, but also about half of all 12 to 34 year olds in the U.S. claim to be uh, monthly listeners of podcasts. Uh, can you just talk about, uh, you know, what you guys are seeing there and, and you know, any initiatives around uh, driving those demos to podcasts? I think overall uh, podcast user, excuse me, Spotify's user base um, does skew um, relatively younger than the population overall. And so um, if you take that age distribution and map it to the increase in uh, penetration of podcast listing on our platform, that's going to lead you to have having more relatively younger people listening to podcasts. But that's just half the story. I think the other half of the story is content creation. The fact that um, it is now many, many uh, next generation podcasters are using tools like Anchor who are creating content that is resonant with younger audiences. Got it. Uh, The other uh, thing that we've certainly noticed around podcasting or podcast listeners is their uh, duration when it comes to, to listening to podcasts. So, uh, you know, most podcast listeners finish or, you know, listen to most or an entire episode and, and only about 7% leave after half. And that's really in, in stark contrast to what the, at least the anecdote is around digital consumers, broadly speaking, uh, where it said that attention spans are shrinking so much so that they're actually lower attention spans than a goldfish at about eight seconds. Uh, and it's not just uh, listening to full podcasts, but there's also a, a persistence there uh, where podcasters are, you know, coming back often of weekly podcast listeners. The average is about six podcasts uh, downloaded and listened to in a week. Um, what do you think it is about podcasts that are, you know, leading to that, that stickiness um, and, and sort of willingness to uh, stick it out for full episodes and, and keep coming back for more? Well, I think the successful podcast creators create the hook for their audiences to come back, whether that's um, in a story that's compellingly narrated and has a person hanging to hear the next episode or a personality who people find as a a trusted voice in their life and they're going to come back every Monday, every Wednesday, whenever that will be to hear what that person has to say and what they has to have to say about what's going on in the world. Which, which, whatever the format is, these formats are attracting users and creating habits. And on Spotify, what we're trying to do is identify those habits so that we can personalize content and get you more of what you like or, or more of what we think you might like to only expand uh, and extend these habits. 
So I, I, I feel that, Sheila, because, you know, uh, listening as an avid listener to, say, like the Pivot podcast with uh, Kara Swisher and Scott Galloway, it's, yeah, sure, they have some good insights on sort of what's going on in the general zeitgeist of, you know, tech and media and sometimes now politics. But, you know, I just can't wait to tune in just to hear what crazy shit Scott Galloway is going to come up with because that's how the big dog rolls go on. It's just, you know, he's just, it's just, it's compelling, right? It's like, uh, I don't know, it's a cross between television, comedy. I'm not really sure what you call it, but I just know that it works. My observation is in this time of Corona, what are we seeing in terms, how is this, you know, consumption changing? I know I used to primarily listen to podcasts when I was commuting to work, back when we'd had that sort of thing, and now I don't commute anymore. So I find myself having to carve out time in order to listen to my podcast, and increasingly I do that while I work out, so that when I feel the pain of, you know, my muscles, I feel the pain of, you know, Scott Galloway. Well, um, Terry, COVID de has definitely had an impact on podcast listening. And I think globally, it's been reported that podcast listening um, came down um, as the pandemic was spreading, um, generally related to commuting time. Um, however, we've seen that lightening up, which is great. Um, but the other thing that's changed is the type of content people are listening to. Um, there, as you might have predicted, but we saw in the data, there was such a, a stronger orientation towards news, news podcasts and kids podcasts of all things. They really took uh, prominence over other categories. Uh, in a normal environment, we saw much more distributed listening across uh, a handful of important categories, but obviously news has spiked recently. Terry, certainly hard to ignore uh, the big dog and the jungle cat. So I hear you on the on the pivot thing. Um, you know, Sheila, you've talked a lot about content creation, and I think uh, that's been one of the fascinating areas of the podcast ecosystem. We have seen uh, just a massive amount of new content coming online. You know, I think I mentioned uh, earlier, as of today, there's actually a million active podcasts uh, sort of globally and 30 million episodes coming from that. So just a ton of, of content uh, and variety out there. And you know, on the variety front, these are increasingly uh, taking on new genres. So what started as more of sort of talk host type conversations has now expanded into a wide realm of those. There's fiction, there's nonfiction, there's uh, you know, things that are more akin to, to TV series. Uh, so sort of a wider and wider range of, of genres coming out. We're also uh, you know, noticing that podcasts, while still very much in longer form, are starting to trend downward a little bit. So uh, the median podcast length uh, via report by Pacific Content is about 40 minutes today. The average is slightly higher uh, from that. There, while there's a very wide range here, um, you know, it's it, it, they what they did notice it is starting to to tick down a little bit here. So I'd love to get your views on on sort of the content uh, a little more broadly. But uh, maybe just to kick it off, um, you know, of the four acquisitions you've done in the last year, and, and I think where you've spent more of the the money has been on actually acquiring content that you now own. Can you talk about the strategy to to move it into owning content? Absolutely. Uh, why don't I just start by saying a little bit about these companies? Because sure. um, on, on a spreadsheet, they might just all look like podcast studios. But in fact, they're three very unique businesses. Uh, the first acquisition we made is Gimlet. And with Gimlet, we acquired a highly produced, highly researched, acclaimed library of content with regular frequency shows with habitual listening. And we also acquired a team that had built a podcast company end to end from ideation all the way through monetization. And those capabilities are sort of foundational for us. And we realized we needed to scale our business up quickly. Again, all of this is against the backdrop of becoming the world's leading audio network. The next acquisition we made is Parcast. 
Now, ParCast is a format specialist. They are a leading storyteller in a highly scripted format for with a specialty in, in true crime. Now, true crime is also one of the largest categories in podcasts, and we felt that it was really important to have a beachhead in true crime to really put, um, lay a stake in the, put a stake in the ground for pod, podcast content. However, also, ParCast has an incredibly nimble production process, which allows them to bring a lot of content to market quickly and to change it up. And we've really taken advantage of that since they've become part of Spotify. The third company we acquired is The Ringer. Now, uh, why The Ringer? Well, our own data told us that sports is just a juggernaut category, but within sports, there is very little to buy because sports is a very, very difficult category. However, Bill Simmons is an absolutely unique talent. And uh, not only did we um, get to acquire Bill Simmons and the Bill Simmons podcast, I should say, but an amazing network of shows that is built on this unique format of timely talk, comment, and commentary, which is a format that we had no experience in. And we recognized once we got to know Bill and his team, how special it is what they do and how they've created a very compelling network. So when you think about these three companies all together, we've acquired capabilities in three distinct formats, in talent and content, in subjects, across the board in the most important podcast categories, and three unique and very experienced teams. So all of this together gives this, us a really important foundation to take content to the next level. And by the next level, I mean innovating on format, innovating on discovery, innovating on promotion and distribution. All of these things are available to us because we own and control the content. Makes a lot of sense. I think um, in the Rich Greenfield's conversation with Daniel the other day, uh, he made the comment that uh, Daniel did that what you were acquiring was not just content, right? You could go and license if you just wanted the titles, but what you were getting were franchises uh, that can be sort of built off in a, in a deeper way, uh, that, that which definitely resonated with me. Um, you mentioned uh, innovating with format. What do you mean when, you're, when you talk about innovating around format? Well, let's take something as simple as format length. Um, we've, we're working with Bill Simmons, um, whose shows range anywhere from 40 minutes to an hour and 40 minutes typically, um, to do short five minute show, a show for us called The Hottest Take, which is uh, a great idea that he talks about and make it, makes it part of your daily habit to hear Bill's great idea for the day. So. This is a way of taking something that as a tried and true format that's been so successful with a loyal audience and bring it to market in a different way to try to bring more people into the personality and the content habit uh, that's Bill Simmons. So that's just one example. I think um, certainly we can get into other, other uh, new announcements by Spotify. This morning we announced um, a vodcast uh, with two YouTube stars. So we'll be able to present both video and audio uh, content from them. Got it. I also saw you guys announced uh, a reading of Harry Potter from uh, uh, the, the stars of the movies uh, just the other day as well. Yes, that's, um, that's very exciting. We announced that yesterday. And I think um, the first chapter is being read by Daniel Radcliffe. There you go. My sister sent it to me this morning. I was a, a big Harry Potter fan. I guess back in the day, maybe still. <laughs> so I guess moving on from the, the content that is out there, the other big aspect of uh, content is the actual creation of content. Um, and you guys have certainly done stuff here. Just to you know, sort of touch on this for, for listeners who are maybe less familiar, one of the big, you know, or sort of two of the big reasons why content has flourished so much in podcasting is this relatively uh, simple ease and, and limited cost of both the creation and the distribution of podcasts. So on the creation side, you know, you mostly need a microphone and yourself, maybe a guest uh, and some content to talk about. And on the distribution side, uh, most podcasts have been set up via this thing called the RSS feed, uh, whereby you can very easily host all the um, sort of crucial elements of your podcast allow uh, subscribers to subscribe to them and fairly easily distribute it out to uh, any different listener app. And, and just to click a, a 
level deeper on the RSS feed, you know, this is a standard web format. It's been around since Netscape in 99. Uh, it holds all the metadata, artwork, and content of a show. Uh, the apps, the listener apps are able to tap into it to automatically uh, get updates so that as you publish your podcast, it automatically sends the newest um, episode to, to all the listener apps. Consumers are then able to describe on there. And this is can be hosted on your own or it can be hosted through a, a wide variety of free and premium hosting services. Uh, one of which uh, Spotify acquired in their announcement last February, uh, February 2019, with the acquisition of Anchor. Uh, so can you just talk about what is Anchor at, at maybe a deeper level and, uh, and what's the strategy around uh, these hosting and creator initiatives? Sure. Uh, we acquired Anchor in February of 2019. And when we uh, got to know the company over several months prior to that, um, we saw that the value prop of free hosting and leading creator tools was winning. And more and more creators were coming to Anchor to create their podcasts. And so since we've acquired Anchor, we've really leaned in heavily to this. We've uh, launched a ton of new features for creators through Anchor. Uh, you see your trailers, keyword tagging, message call-ins. There's also social sharing, episode scheduling, video to audio capabilities. All of this is just enhancing um, the ways that creators can bring their content to life. Now, um, what's the result of that? Well, an explosion of creators, and in fact, 70% of new podcasts that are distributed on Spotify have come from Anchor. These yeah, that's a, tools, a staggering these tools number. really allow creators to just up-level their work and uh, make it more interesting and engaging for users. Now, on the other side of the page, you have um, an image of Spotify for podcasters. Uh, Spotify for podcasters is an industry-leading dashboard that allows podcasters to get real data on who's actually listening to their podcasts and how they're listening to them. This really wasn't available until Spotify made it available to all creators. So if you think about these initiatives all together, we are really up leveling um, and bringing value to creators throughout the value chain. The long tail podcaster who's doing this for the first time all the way to the head of the market. Got it. Yeah. It, you know, so you've got the, the, able, the ability to push it onto your platform and then actually, you know, understand what it's doing. Um, I mentioned the, the RSS feed, uh, which has, you know, been a great tool or, or simple solution, um, but it is also a, a, you know, fairly, I guess, simple and, and, and antiquated uh, solution for getting content online. Um, you know, I fully understand the, the ability to do it, you know, make it free, but it feels a little bit like the, the cookie of podcasting, right? It was a simple solution that maybe has gone too far. Do you think that the RSS feed will continue to be synonymous with podcasting as we uh, get into the future? Or uh, do you see that uh, sort of going away as bigger platforms come on board? Well, I think as, as you said, Connor, RSS was great for getting content created uh, and distributed easily. I think now that we have a pretty scaled base of content out there and a very scaled uh, user base listening to that content, the next opportunities are to um, create more engaging uh, content to create feedback loops between listeners and creators, and most of, probably most importantly, monetization. And so I think the challenge will be for the ad ecosystem around RSS to really be able to bring advertising demand to creators. So far, yeah. that's been a challenge. Yeah. And, you know, with all this creation, wow, one of the, the things that's happening in podcasting is this exceptionally long tail of podcasts. So uh, this is from data from Libsyn. Uh, it's, a, it's a bit dated. It's about a year old, but in general, you can very clearly see there's a massive long tail when it comes to who is actually getting downloads. So only the top, you know, if there's 100 million listeners, there's over a million different podcasts, only the top 1% of those million podcasts is getting even 35,000 downloads uh, per episode. And the median across the entire ecosystem is at 124. So very low as, as you've got a lot of these, um, you know, uh, call mom and pop creators. Uh, 
And this is making discovery a, a huge challenge. Uh, this is another area where you guys have been focusing a lot. Uh, can you just talk about the what is the challenge of discovery around podcasts and what are you guys doing to push this forward? Well, uh, I think we know that discovery is hard. I mean, I think it, you don't have to look further than what has Spotify or Netflix invested to enable discovery in music and video. I mean, it is, it is a really hard problem and it's, it's just equally hard in podcasts. I think the difference in podcasts is that the ecosystem is very different and there are many distribution points, but many of those distribution points have very little technology and very little data. So those are pretty much two pillars that you need to build discovery. Um, and as a result, um, discovery has been based on editorial and editorial doesn't have the benefit of data um, and it tends to skew towards the head. And therefore you have this vicious or reinforcing cycle that the listening is in the head, the monetization is in the head, and there hasn't yet to be a break, uh, um, a way for the longer tail or even the torso to break through into those, you know, fantastic uh, listening and monetization opportunities. Do you think length changing. has anything? <laughs> do you think length has anything to do with that? I, I um, was talking to, to an executive in the audio industry recently who uh, sort of made the reference that, you know, podcasts at, at least at 40 minutes are much more akin to an album versus a, um, versus a song, right? And, and Spotify has been very good at personalizing the discovery around songs. Um, Netflix has certainly done this with longer form content with, with video, although, you know, to put in context, there's about 15,000 titles on Netflix compared to right, a million titles on, on Spotify. Um, what, what do you think? Do you think the length has an impact on that discovery? I think length is just one of the variables. I think um, certainly someone needs to know that they have an hour and a half available to them before they sink in and commit to an hour and a half long podcast. But I think, again, that's just one element of the, of the equation. What we've tried to do um, to really drive discovery at Spotify, I think of in three themes. One is just making you aware of podcasts. So if you have um, been tracking what your homepage looks like on Spotify for the last year, you will see that more and more podcasts are being promoted, podcast selections are being offered. Um, we're just trying to get the visibility of podcasts um, more prominent. That's a starting point. The next thing, which I think is a, an innovation that Spotify is uniquely capable for, is podcast playlists. Just like we did in music, we have personalized pay playlists like your podcast playlist um, or genre-based playlists. Um, here we have an image of um, the best podcasts of the week. Um, that may sound simple, but actually we um, uh, identify and uh, promote over a hundred uh, podcasts in best podcasts of the week. And we've actually customized that over five different global geographies. So podcast playlists are um, evolving quickly on the platform and it's a great way for us to get feedback from users on their engagement with the content. The other thing we're doing is thinking about how to combine music and podcast consumption in a more integrated way where the user gets um, more enjoyment out of both. The first initiative we uh, presented around this is your daily drive, which is a mixture of personalized music selections for you and news. Um, it's had amazing success uh, and certainly um, it, it is something by the name your daily drive is intended as a commuting like experience, but doesn't have to be. And it's been a great discovery tool for podcasts. It's when we include a podcast in daily drive, it's a kickoff to um, establishing many more long term uh, listener podcast relationships. Yeah, it seems like a pretty seamless way to, to get someone who's already on your platform to, to ease into it, I think. In the, I don't have it here, but the, I know the Edison and, and Triton research have shown in the past, at least, that some of the biggest challenges of getting new people is just where do I start uh, when it comes to podcasting? And so uh, certainly putting it front and center, giving them options as to what's been curated as the best, and then you know sliding it into their commute seemed to, to make a lot of sense. So 
Why don't we move on now to monetization? Uh, you know, I think as uh, the bankers and, and corporate development in the room, uh, this is certainly an area we focus a lot on and think a lot about. Uh, and it's pretty clear that, you know, from both the consumer side, there is scale and persistence of consumers. There's also a robust content ecosystem, two things that are really crucial for creating a scaled monetization platform. Uh, now in media, there are typically two primary monetization strategies, uh, advertising and subscription. There are you know, certainly offshoots from those, but, but those tend to be the two primary channels. Interestingly, we've noticed in digital, more broadly speaking, digital consumers are taking steps to avoid ads. Uh, there's about 47% of consumers today use ad blockers. And if you look at uh, more of the music audio industry and the TV ecosystem, there's a huge drive towards subscription. Um, you know, you guys certainly have a big subscription uh, platform and then you've got the likes of Netflix, uh, Disney Plus, Hulu, et cetera. Interestingly, in uh, podcasting, uh, subscriptions have actually not fared so well. So uh, here's an example from Tim Ferriss. Tim Ferriss has, has one of the leading podcasts um, and has been doing it for a number of years. And earlier last year, he decided he was going to run this test where he was going to stop doing ads. They were you know, taking too much time for him and his team. He had to test out the products that they were going to advertise, et cetera and look to do a fan supported model. Uh, so, you know, quote unquote subscription, it, it obviously a little nuanced, uh, but it turns out uh, he had to cancel his, his uh, experiment one month into the six month experiment because he had such strong pushback from his consumers. Uh, he, while well, he had a number of subscribers, he heard overwhelmingly that people were comfortable listening to ads, want, in fact, wanted to hear the ads and the products that he was pushing. And so it seems that in, uh, in podcasting, consumers are really more okay with this ad value prop. And, and we see this across all media, the, the value prop tends to be you get free content and in exchange you get, uh, you give your attention. And you know, generally in digital, you're also giving your data, although probably less so uh, in podcasting. Um, can you talk about uh, this sort of phenomenon? Why, you know, you think, uh, podcast consumers are, are so okay with advertising, at least compared to, you know, digital consumers more broadly? Well, I think it's twofold. Um, podcast consumers are conditioned to get the content for free. So that's, that's a widespread, widespread um, user assumption. So I think we start there and then along with content, they've also had um, a very enjoyable experience of listening to their host, um, not only on the content of the show, but the host typically also reads the ad. So the ads are, have um, a non-intrusive uh, component to them. And uh, with the highly sort of engaged listener, they also have a sense of um, authority that comes along with them. And I think the combination of the um, accustomed to know ads and the relatively unobtrusive and accepting uh, circle of trust nature of the ads this has made that a very uh, a value prop that consumers are prepared to go with. It really, it really is incredible when you think about it. It's like full circle in media, right? Because we kind of started off in radio like a century ago with brands sponsoring you had radio shows, right? You had the whatever, the well, Tide was more in the TV world. That was the early days of TV as well. But in the early days of radio, you had, you know, the sponsor brought to you by such and such theater, right? So it was kind of like full circle. Personally, I kind of find it interesting to hear the uh, personality read out the ad. You kind of get to gauge, you know, are they, uh, how, how seriously are they taking this and how good a pitch person, you know, are they? And often when they add their own color commentary to the, to the copy, I find that, I find it uh, just fascinating. And so it prevents me from hitting the fast forward 15 second button, you know, four times in a row. So yeah, I, you know, in a world of authenticity, it's yet another ad format that sort of reaches that sort of breakout attention component that you hard to find in other, in other media. Yeah, certainly hard to find authenticity in, in lots of other advertising. 
um, as well as the, the trust uh, aspect, right? If the consumers are trusting and, and want to have the ads, it's also, you know, a lot of trust from the marketer side uh, to have that ability where there are so many host read ads that, you know, seemingly ad lib a fair amount of, of what goes into it or, or, or stopping short in the, um, uh, in the ad read. Um, sorry, Sheila, I think you were about to say something. Well, I was going to say that um, what, what we're seeing, though, is that the concept of the benefit of the host red ad can, can, can really be stretched. And there are probably several podcasts that you listen to that actually don't have any host red ads and have mostly narrator or producer red ads. But you don't even notice because you're accustomed to having that voice that's selected to be consistent with the tenor of the show you may not even notice that this, the reader has moved from the host to a narrator because they've kept the look and feel and style of the content um, can, can, is consistent with the ad. Yep. So, you know, talking about how much advertising is there here, um, you know, we have seen a lot of growth here. There's been about a 46% Kager uh, from 2015 up to 2021. So. Growing from a you know pretty small hundred million dollar uh, platform to you know almost a billion this year, uh, potentially a billion next year. These are are sort of pre-COVID numbers. I I don't have updates as to where that will go from here. Um, so definitely a lot of growth in podcasting ad spend. Yet when you compare it to the overall audio ad spend, it's still a very tiny amount. So even getting to a billion dollars by 2021. Uh, it's a small fraction compared to the 14 billion that the radio industry has been able to maintain uh, in the in the U.S. and it's been pretty consistent over a number of years. Um, a lot of this has to do with the notion of uh, similar to the long tail uh, of creation or, or just content that's out there. There's also this massive long tail around the monetization where only those top podcasts uh, are able to get monetized. Uh, can you talk about what, what's going on here? Why is it so challenging for the long tail to, uh, to monetize their podcasts? Well, I think it goes back to the discovery um, discussion we just had. Um, still so much of the listening is happening at the head. Um, so first of all, you've got to get eyeball, uh, excuse me, ears onto the content. <laughs> and then once you have ears onto the content, you need to be able to present um, the advertising buying opportunity in a manner that advertisers are willing to pay for it. And so what uh, advertisers are looking for is audience targeting, measurability, and understanding that their ad is being effective. And right now, um, the industry is struggling to deliver on those key uh, value props that are necessary to really bring uh, ad buys into the market. Yep, makes sense. And then, you know, on this chart, um, there's an interesting chart I saw from Andreessen Horowitz uh, paper uh, about a year ago, and it talked about the average revenue per active hour. And, and as you can see, um, podcast is very low consider, uh, based on the overall amount of consumption, right? Uh, you've got, you know, newspapers and magazines over 50 cents, internet around 24 cents, TV at 13 and podcasts all the way down at, at four cents. Um, this seems to, you know, if you did a quick look at this, you might assume that that means CPMs are, are quite low, uh, but it turns out, you know, CPMs are actually quite high. It's really more a function of that long tail aspect that's not being, um, uh, that's not being monetized. Can you talk about just a little bit about what are you guys seeing around CPMs in podcasting? Uh, we, oh, certainly in the head content, CPMs are, are very robust. Um, we've obviously had um, the ad market has had some um, temporary dislocation because of um, the pandemic, but certainly uh, for the last year we've seen very strong CPMs um, across head content. Um, but until we create buying mechanisms for the long tail, they're just going to be starved for that, those ad dollars. So that is the challenge and the opportunity. Yeah. And, and I guess sort of, you know, naturally lead into the next thought is, that, you know, today, or at least historically, there have been all these limitations around podcast ads, whether that's the, you know, amount that can be monetized, um, you know, or, or just general workflow. So 
uh, sort of listed four things out here, the workflow and the platform, measurement, addressability, and interactivity, all, all things that are sort of coming to the podcast ad ecosystem. I guess starting on platform, uh, it seems to me at least that part of what's held up uh, advertising and podcasting is that the original uh, sort of 800 pound gorilla platform was Apple, which is an ad adverse platform, right? They are not uh, pushing to do advertisements. They don't open up advertisements on their platform. And so it really left uh, a lot of the monetization to be on the, the content creators themselves to, to set up and, and go out and, and attract themselves. Um, I guess, would you agree with this assertion? And, and uh, you know, what do you see as the keys to improving uh, monetization from the platform standpoint? Well, I think you're right in that monetization was left uh, in the hands of creators and most of these creators were small independent businesses. And so what grew up around them were other small independent businesses that harnessed ad spend primarily from direct response advertisers to really get the ad industry for podcasts off the ground. Um, but I think as we've all acknowledged that has some limitations because there's a big world of advertising well beyond um, the DR advertisers that is intrigued by podcasts, but just can't figure out how to buy them. Yeah. And, and how about addressability? Um, can you just uh, explain where address, where we are with addressability uh, in podcasting today? Well, generally buying a podcast ad is sort of like buying a magazine ad. You decide to invest in the advertisement based on the people that you think will be looking at the magazine ad based on some survey data that's been, that's been taken in the past by on the reader base. You think you know how many people will see your ad based on what the publisher says the circulation is, but you don't actually know who actually saw the ad. So that's kind of where we are looking backwards in terms of podcast advertising. The opportunity is to take it forward and make it a truly digital medium where you can target the users that you want to find and you can actually track whether they listen to the podcast and then any actions that they may have taken after that. That is the next generation. And that's why Spotify introduced streaming ad insertion earlier this year, which we're just rolling out now. But the opportunity with streaming ad insertion is that, Connor, you and I could be listening to the same podcast, but we would receive completely different ads based on who we are and what our interests are. Yeah, it seems, so that brings up, it seems to oh. me that that's really the only way to scale monetization, in particular in the long tail, is to be able to aggregate, you know, sell on an audience base, you know, develop the addressability, the dynamic ad insertion, sell on audience, and then be able to aggregate that audience. We certainly saw that play out in digital, and we're seeing that as well play out in the OTT app world, where the traditional TV world was was very different, and and now they're bringing a new a new paradigm to it. Why? Why, Sheila, can you not do that today on your own platform since you have the data on listening? Well, I want to make sure I understand the question, but I think, I think you're probably getting at the difference between um, what is referred to in the industry right now as um, dynamic ad insertion versus where we are going um, and have launched, which is streaming ad insertion. The difference is with streaming is that we're actually inserting the ad at the time that the consumer is actually consuming the content. And so you, there is a, a one-to-one -one in terms of the ad and the ad impression okay. where in the rest of the podcast ecosystem, the ad is inserted at the time of download, but you don't actually know whether the download was actually ever listened to. So we're really closing the loop between um, the expected versus actual impressions. And I'm using the term impression because it's the term of art in the industry, but listens is probably more accurate. Got it. Yeah, yeah and that's also a function of the, the sort of hosting and RSS feed nature where a lot it's coming baked in as you guys get the, the download. So um, versus an audio file, it's on your platform where you can control the, the breaks, right? Yes. Um, I'm curious, you know, you're uh, having, you know, been at WPP for a long time, been very close to the, the digital advertising ecosystem. 
uh, you know, it's often said there was a, a bit of a double-edged sword when it came to programmatic and addressability where, yes, you're able to monetize the longer tail, but for the, the head, this can lead to uh, actually lowering CPMs as it's now just based on audience and not just on the content. Um, I know in, in sort of the OTT and, and convergent TV world, this is something that's a, a you know, grave concern. Um, how are you thinking about that as it relates to podcast advertising? Uh, well, it's such early days, Connor, in terms of being able to segment inventory in the way that you're describing. Um, I will say right now, you know, head podcasts still have the benefit of having advertisers vie for a limited number of inventory slots that they have. Um, and I can see that continuing to happen until we have a flu truly fluid market across all inventory types. Makes sense. Um, I'm going to move on and, and leave interactivity and measurement. I, I know there's some um, developments coming to measurement. Interactivity, uh, you know, certainly could be talking about voice and smart speakers, but it looks like we're about 255. So I want to get to the ecosystem uh, in the last few minutes here. Um, so, yeah, so just capping it off on the ecosystem, you know, unsurprisingly, given the growth of consumers, the growth of content, uh, usage, and monetization, uh, there's really been an ecosystem that has sprung up around podcasting. Uh, we've seen a significant increase in fundraising from VCs just over the last few years. So, you know, down from, uh, uh, you know, 30 million or so up through 2014. And then we've seen a huge uptick peaking at uh, over 300 million in, in new uh, investments last year into 35 companies. Uh, all this activity led us at Luma to realize uh, it was high time we created an audio LumaScape. Now, this is a little um, broader than just uh, than just podcasting. It really looks at the audio and a little bit of the voice ecosystems. Um, and as we are more focused on uh, the business side of things, uh, and given that podcasting audio is very ad driven, this is very much focused on like many of our LumaScapes, sort of marketer across the people and, and the companies in between. Um, just to give a, a sort of quick view for, for anyone who has not gone through this before, if you're going left and right uh, at the top, it starts with the agencies and those creating ads. We then look at the monetization sections, both those who are audio first and, and those who are more omni-channel. Uh, the middle orange parts are really focused on the workflow aspects around audio uh, with, with data and measurement below that sort of spreads across. And then the right uh, is, a, is a big focus on the content, whether that's uh, the broadcasters, the streaming platforms, uh, and the content properties themselves. Uh, and then at the bottom, a, an array of uh, sort of voice-enabled uh, technologies. Um, just, you know, shout out here that we are very well aware these things are uh, living, breathing documents and, and far from perfect. So, uh, you know, anyone listening, feel free to reach out to us where we're wrong or, or for new additions. You know, and then finally on the ecosystem, uh, before turning it over to you, uh, there's been a lot of M&A. And this is certainly an area where you guys have been very active. Um, we've seen a, a big uptick really starting in 2018, uh, where there were about uh, eight uh, acquisitions in and around podcasts um, and, and sort of digital audio monetization. And then even more in 2019, where there was a big emphasis on the content side of things uh, for podcasts. Uh, so, you know, I guess um, thinking about M&A uh, and, and the, or the ecosystem overall, Maybe we'll start actually back at, at sort of the funding side. What are you seeing around new company formation uh, in this ecosystem? And, you know, are there any particular areas that you're uh, seeing or expect to see a lot of activity, whether that's, you know, content, publisher tools, monetization? Well, there is a constant um, and exciting stream of creators coming into the market, people who have stories to tell and information to share. And I think that that is just a very uh, healthy phenomenon and shows that more people think that it's worth spending their time creating something for audio. And I expect that only to accelerate as more innovative tools are available and mon more monetization is available. So that, that I think is a, is a, a growing trend. Um, the other thing we're seeing is people who are creating tools to help both creators and advertisers understand the investments that they're making. 
Um, so analytics around um, content and analytics around advertising. I think, however, there are gonna be limitations on the uh, advertising analytics um, as it becomes clear that we're still not able to totally close the gap yet um, uh, until we have see the advent of streaming ad insertion that really measures true listening. Um, but I think a lot of advancements are being made across the board in elevating um, the discipline around ad, ad investment. And then on, on m and uh, I mean, you've certainly been active and, and we've talked about this uh, a bunch doing four acquisitions in the last uh, year or so. Uh, how do you guys think about build versus buy in this ecosystem? Well, we have done a number of acquisitions, um, uh, but it is a growing space and we have huge ambitions. So I think that we are, we are still very interested in making sure that we have all the best talent, assets, and know-how as part of our, um, our quest to become the world's largest audio network. So I, I can't see us slowing down. Um, but we do have the opportunity to build a lot more things given what we've acquired. Um, and so you've seen, for example, streaming ad insertion is our own product that we're building and developing on our own platform. Um, however, we certainly are not closed and I'd love to talk to any other interesting businesses that are springing up and help helping to evolve the ecosystem. Yeah, that's all I heard. You guys are open for buying. So, uh, you know, that's the, that's the key thing for us. Um, I mean, one other question as it relates to sort of M&A and who's playing in this space, uh, you know, it's interesting, we noticed that a lot of the earlier acquisitions were from more traditional uh, media players who maybe were tapping into to podcasting early. Uh, in the last year, there's been a lot more activity from, you know, some of the more uh, digitally focused players. And then even uh, you've got a company like Penn National buying Barstool Sports, which, you know, is, is broader than the just podcasting, but certainly an, an element of it. Um, do you see a, a sort of trend of who you think will be, you know, active in that space? Uh, do you think there will be continued uh, engagement from the traditional players, more digital focus? Any, any thoughts on that? Well, I know that um, many of the uh, traditional radio players have stated that podcasts and spoken word audio are an important part of their future strategies. So I imagine that they will want to continue to play in this ecosystem in some way. Um, and we've seen them do deals historically. Um, as to um, who else might come in or be more active, um, you know, I leave that to the banker's crystal ball. I feel like Spotify's charted, charted a big lead. Um, but it is a growing business and the growing a business, growing businesses attract capital and competition. So we're re but we're ready for it. So we're happy to, to bring some new entrants in and do some deals. Yeah. Um, well, great. I think, uh, you know, we, we had scheduled some time for Q and A if, if we have time, Terry and Cheryl, let you guys make that call, but maybe just to, to cap it off here. Um, any things you would leave us with uh, some key factors that you see as sort of shaping the future of the ecosystem? I think we've touched on the really important themes here. Uh, to my mind, the things that are going to drive the ecosystem uh, from this point forward are first and foremost, discovery and personalization. Uh, we need to improve and continue to improve user engagement. So we bring more people in. So they spend more time with podcasts and they, they listen to a much wider array of content. Um, now, this job of discovery, as I said earlier, can really only be done by platforms that have real scale of user data to work with. And so I, I expect you'll continue to see Spotify be a leader there. Um, uh, the next thing I think it's, it will be as as important is uh, broadening the advertising ecosystem and bringing in a whole categories of advertisers who are sitting on the sidelines, like brands, for example, who really couldn't buy podcasts until they can get the type of measurability and addressability that they need. So that'll be another big shift. And as more monetization comes into the ecosystem, we'll see more creators coming to go after that, those dollars which I guess right. the third leg of the school stool, which is content. Um, 
And I think we're going to see, just as we've seen in video, we're going to see amazing innovation in audio, whether it's interactivity, visual layers, variable lengths, um, music integration, all of these things are coming. So um, listen in. Can't think of podcasts as you, as you know them today going forward. Um, great. So, uh, you know, the next section was to do Q and A. We are at the, you know, sort of top of the hour here, uh, Terry. Yeah, like, I if think you want to try to fit in any, top of the hour, but let's uh, let's fire off. Let's do some lightning round questions. I'll throw them out, and Sheila, if you want to grab them, or Connor, we'll do uh, rapid fire. Um, touching on your last point, uh, Sheila, um, and maybe uh, Connor, you can end the uh, the share. Um, we, uh, you had mentioned like video and it's so exciting, right? To have this new media channel, new media format. That's, I mean, relatively new with sort of lots of green shoots in terms of expanding audience, expanding content, expanding, you know, revenue monetization, everything is like up and to the right, which is fantastic. Um, uh, and you mentioned like video and earlier you coined a term I had not heard before vodcast. Um, which I presumably incorporates sort of podcasts that are also videotaped. You see this with many of the podcasters, Joe Rogan uh, probably being the, the, the biggest one, where not only does he um, put the audio on a, on a podcast platform, but also there is a video available often on YouTube or, or other video distribution uh, platforms where you can just watch it if you so choose to consume the media that way. Is there... Is there something distinctive about having the option on multi-channel or is it just more uh, under the, should we file that under the rubric of, you know, more ways to monetize the better? I would start with more ways to engage the better. Okay. Um, this is really about creating uh, compelling experiences for users on Spotify. And um, there are certainly some types of creators who feel like they can, uh, make their content as effective in the combination of uh, video and audio. And so we are starting kicking off with um, the announcement we made earlier today to have um, uh, a new podcast on Spotify, which you will have to tap the screen to see the video. Um, there, we're going to get a ton of learnings on user behavior and engagement with video from this. So it's exciting. When, uh, when you talk about, um, Oh, here's a, just a basic question. Uh, when, when you guys talked about the content creation and the long tail and where a lot of the, the listening and, and monetization is taking place, the preponderance of that, I presume, is in the English language or, you know, w w what is the state of, since Spotify is a global company with downloads uh, in pretty much uh, every country, what does the opportunity in German, French, Italian, Serbian, Chinese, what does it look like for non-English language podcasting? Well, I think uh, it, it, it does mirror sort of the, what you'd say the, the established media ecosystem in those languages. So in countries like um, Germany, for example, um, there's a very expert, well-developed media ecosystem there, and there is fantastic podcast content, and there is very strong podcast listening. Um, and we have some really leading podcasts on, on Spotify uh, to, that reflect that. In other markets, like Indonesia, for example, the media ecosystem hasn't been established with the level of capital and company formation, and neither have podcasts. And in those situations, we've seen like an amazing uptick of um, long tail uh, and first generation creators coming directly to podcast because it's easy and inexpensive to get your content out. Is so far most of the, I guess, all of the ad format uh, in terms of uh, the podcasting, sort of in-stream podcasting, is done in the endemic media format. That is to say, if you're listening in audio it, to the editorial, the ad is in also in audio. Have you guys looked at, thought about, experimented with um, displaying an ad in a different format? Could you? Could you have a video ad on your mobile phone while you're listening to an audio podcast or does that not make sense? Well, I, I think we're taking, we're taking small steps here, Terry, because what we know about podcast advertising is that um, it has uh, 
the users like it, appreciate it, um, find it consistent with their listing experience, and it's also able to garner very high pricing. So we don't want to take away from the magic of the um, host narrator read experience, um, but you could see that we could include some other innovations that we're working on for content could just as likely apply to um, advertisements like interactivity or voice activation or other things that could um, give even more um, cues and data for advertisers, but also be engaging for listeners. Gotcha. Awesome. Well, uh, Connor, uh, great job on driving this uh, dialogue on this fascinating uh, topic of, uh, of podcasting. Sheila, I cannot thank you enough for joining us and lending your industry uh, expertise as, a, as an operator, as a strategic uh, thinker and deal maker in the sector. I think this is a category that, again, if one of the few ones that it's, you know, growing and we're just discovering it, and there's, I think, a ton of potential ahead. And uh, I have to just say, I finish with, uh, you know, I love to see companies like Spotify, independent, uh, uh, you know, proudly, progressively leaning forward in terms of technology deployment and still kicking the ass of the big guys. That is to say, the giant guy. You guys are already big, but, but you know, you're up against some very formidable competition from tech giants that have many, many multiples of your scale and arguably, you know, could cross subsidize and, and all of that. And yet in the, in the face of all that competition, it, uh, Spotify is uh, still leading the way. I love to see that. How can a, you know, massive multi-company still be viewed as the David? It, you got to be from Sweden, I guess. So, uh, Kudos to you for that. And thanks again for joining us. Um, we are, uh, that concludes uh, the state of podcasting for Luma's work from home webinar. Please tune in next Wednesday at two o'clock where my partner, Mark Greenbaum and I will cover the art of the exit, the sort of uh, Luma's take on how to do strategic corporate development. Uh, thank you all for tuning in. See you next Wednesday.